Hello, and welcome to the second installment of the speaker series, The Liberal Imaginary and Beyond, which is co-sponsored by the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University, the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University, and the Center on Modernity and Transition. I'm Benjamin Schul, the Senior Fellow at the Keenan Institute for Ethics and Director of the Center on Modernity and Transition, and I'll be one of your hosts for the speaker series. And I'm Shahrazad Sabet. I'm a fellow at the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University, and I'll be your other host. The aim of the speaker series is to examine the origins, contents, and development of liberalism after the Second World War, as well as to consider significant attempts to move beyond the resultant social imaginary without casting aside its impressive achievements. A quick note to participants, if you'd like to submit questions, there is a Q&A box, so you can submit your questions there, and we will try to include them into the conversation. Um, we're thrilled to have with us today Akia Bill Grammy and Charles Taylor, who will be discussing the topic, Secularism and the Political Culture of Modern Societies. Akia Bill Grammy is the C Sydney Morgan Besser Professor of Philosophy at Columbia University and author of Secularism, Identity, and Enchantment. Charles Taylor is Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at McGill University and author of Sources of the Self, A Secular Age, and co-author of the recent work, Reconstructing Democracy. Akil and Charles, thanks very much for being here. Yes, a very Thank warm you. welcome to you both. Very glad to be here. Thank you. We're hoping to make it a tradition of the speaker series to start on a more personal and biographical mm -hmm. note. So before we dive in more directly, I want to start by asking each of you to tell us a little bit about the um, questions, the curiosities, the experiences that have inspired you to think about secularism and the political culture of modern societies. In other words, what are some of the pathways, whether intellectual or more personal, that have led you to this topic? Akil, mm -hmm. perhaps we could start with you. You know, I grew up in a very secular uh, Muslim home in in uh, India, and uh, and I was really brought up in a family in which uh, secular figures, secularist figures like uh, Nehru and so on, who was the prime minister of India, then we were, we were sort of brought up to 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 love people like Nehru as if we were a member of our own family. Uh, and, and I think this is true of many secular Muslim homes. So, so secularism was very much part of, of uh, my upbringing. Uh, but I really got involved in writing about it only, um, I, actually I very vividly remember because it was on February 14th, 1989, that the fatwa was declared against uh, uh, Salman Rushdie and, and I was asked by public television to to come in and and uh, be interviewed by on the McNeil Lehrer show, and and it's then when I really started thinking about Islamic politics, issues about Islamic identity, secularism, and so on. Thank you, and and Charles, how about you? Well, I have to start by saying that there are sort of two basic models of secularism in the West. And one is secularism, as you would call it in English, and it's a question of time. A secular time is against higher times. But the other one is laïcité in French, and it really has another distinction, the distinction clerical lay, right? And that is spread to other Latin countries like Chita, and it's also spread to Turkey. Laïcité is a, is a term borrowed from French. Now, my my fights about this have been about laïcité, because that's what Quebec, for the same reasons as France uh, in 1905 had their laïcité, Quebec has had its movement from the 1960s, and it raises all the same kind of questions. So that's the, and it, you know, I, there have been several fights. We're in one again now in Quebec about legislation that's been passed, which I consider very discriminatory and but in the name of laïcité. And so that's been uh, very much my, <laughs> my experience. Well, that takes us right to, to our next question, um, which, which you've started to touch on a bit. 
to start us off, I wanted to ask you both to speak briefly about the concept of secularism, which can be a very tricky term. Uh, in one essay, for example, by Dan Philpott, I believe he identifies something like 11 different prominent ways in which the term has been used. So I want to ask you um, more specifically, what meaning do you ascribe to it in your work? Um, yeah. How do you tend to use the term secularism and why do you find that particular usage advantageous? Charles, perhaps we yeah. can start with you since you, you started to go in that direction. Yeah, well, I mean, for me, the proper time, type of secularism, the proper type of laicite, is one which really bases on two principles. One, that the, the state, the common institutions, are neutral between different positions, either religious or anti-religious or non-religious or whatever, right? And secondly that the goal should be a maximum freedom of conscience to practice whatever you believe in, of course, in the usual restrictions that it doesn't uh, tread on the rights of other people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but so these two principles are really the, the basic principles. And, you know, I and another colleague in Quebec have written a book on this, uh, which has been translated into English and other languages. I might add that, connecting up with Akio, that the problems of defining uh, secularism in India played a role because I, I got roped into some discussions about that way back or because of people I collaborate with in India. And it was part of the basis of our thinking when I and uh, Jocelyn Macrier wrote this book on Laicite ouverte, our idea is, we call it open secularism, is against the closed variety, which involves discriminating against various positions. Akil? Yeah, um, you know, if we make a, a, a relatively clean distinction, the distinction can get muddied, but, but if we make a clean distinction between secularization and secularism, um, and I'm assuming that you're asking just about secularism and not secularization. Um, secularism, I, I see it um, as a, a political position. It's purely political uh, doctrine. It's not, um, it's not a name for a, a sort of process of social transformation uh, as secularization is. And as a political doctrine, I, I don't really see it as a, the kind of neutrality that, that Charles is talking about. Though I've, I've thought a lot about Charles's work and, and especially that essay of his on re redefining secularism. Uh, my sense is that the way it, it emerged in Europe and, and even in India, uh, the, the sense in which uh, secularism applies to the polity is that is that it gives a kind of priority, what philosophers and, and economists like to call a lexicographical priority of certain principles in the constitution, which are, don't mention religion or opposition to religion. Uh, they tend to give a priority to those principles uh, in, in the constitution or in, in the uh, legal structures of, of a nation uh, over uh, the exercises of freedom of uh, religious practice if there's a clash between them. So the way, the way I see it is that secularism is a modest doctrine. It's not exactly neutrality, but it's, it's modest in the sense that, that in liberal democracies, constitutions allow freedom of religious belief and practice. But if the, the deliverances of that freedom uh, result in clashes with principles that are, are uh, neutrally described, not mentioning religion, not mentioning opposition to religion, uh, then those principles are given a priority over the free. And so the way I capture the, I would like to capture what Charles has in mind by this neutrality is to, is to say that you must stress the first commitment to, to freedom of religion and practice. You must stress that. It's only illiberal societies which don't stress that, Soviet Union, say, or Turks, Turkey, and so on. And, and 
France bordering on it from time to time, even though it's a liberal dem democratic polity. But but then, um, uh, given that freedom, if if the exercises of that freedom clash with these principles, uh, which are neutrally described without mentioning religion or, or opposition to it, then the principles get priority. And that's what I see secularism as being. So I think we've got slightly different things, but they may coincide extensionally. Uh, you know, I think they, yeah. But I mean, I'll tell you the reason why I think they coincide extensionally. That what the enters into here, and I guess it's part of the second <laughs> conversation about the relation to liberalism, that these are societies that have usually bills of rights, uh, charters of rights, and so on. And it's part of the understanding of charters of rights that any right can be limited, can be limited by, if, if in its exercise, if an exercise of it involves crushing the rights of others or creating an inequality, or it can even be denied, perhaps temporarily, if there's some overriding uh, public aim. I mean, a very good example is what we're living now with, with the pandemic, you know, a lot of the religions, Christianity, Islam, uh, uh, Judaism, require in their practice some getting together in a mosque, in a, a synagogue, in a church. But we ask the various practitioners of these religions for the duration of the pandemic not to do that. And they almost all accept that. So you get, there's a, a necessary reference in any set of rights to limitations on those rights, which are really of the three kinds that I mentioned, you know, trading on the rights of others, creating inequalities, and uh, going against some really overriding urgent public goals. So I think that perhaps we are describing it differently, but that it comes down to <laughs> something very similar in the end. And, and I think it's it's important to to distinguish between secularism in this uh, co-extensional sense, even though it may be co-intentionally slightly different. Uh, we need to distinguish it from state-enforced secularization, which is, I think, mm -hmm. very much what what happened in in other Turks, Turkey, and and uh, uh, and in the Soviet Union. Say, uh, you know. Um, yeah, absolutely. And that there's no freedom of conscience in, in those in those contexts. Or, you know. Well, this leads naturally into the next question, which is about the relationship between secularism and liberalism as a political doctrine. To what extent does the one entail the other and vice versa? Can there be secular societies that are non-liberal or liberal societies that are non-secular? Now, the obvious complicating factor is that neither secularism nor liberalism are static monolithic phenomena. They have and continue to evolve uh, over time and in different regions of the world. So given the broad theme of our speaker series, which is on the uh, development of liberalism after the Second World War, I wonder if you could speak in particular about how secularism and its relationship to liberal politics changed during the middle decades and latter half of the 20th century. Um, Charles, perhaps you could begin by discussing the societies of the North Atlantic. Yeah, well, I think that definitely the 1945 is a takeoff point. Uh, and also 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the UN. And what we see is uh, democracies, which are which have at their core, either expressly or, or implicitly, uh, a notion of rights, of human rights, and uh, equal human rights. And that is something that I suppose it emerges of the terrible experiences of the 1930s and the need to have a uh, constitutions which will guard against this ever happening again. <laughs> Not that we're managing to do that, that that effectively, but that's the idea. And that's where liberalism gets defined, redefined in terms of these notion, this notion of rights. Yeah, so I'm quite happy with that, but uh, I think we need to probe further because there's a, there are big differences even in the North Atlantic world between what we consider um, the scope of the untouchable, if you like, scope of individual action. And there I have to say that in a certain sense, the American Republic is a somewhat of an outlier. I mean, it's not that there is uh, 
quite the contrary, uh, broad agreement. But the the American right, the Republicans, I even the Republicans before um, before Trump, which made it much worse. But even the Republicans had, I think, an exaggerated view of what ought to be the domain of individual freedom, so that claims on uh, individuals for the benefit of the whole, for equality and solidarity of the whole were, anyway, by this stream of American thinking, very much uh, denied. So that is, of course, absolutely crucial to your definition of liberalism, where you stand on that <clears throat> is crucial to your definition of, of liberalism. So, I mean, if you like Reagan, Thatcher, <laughs> uh, liberalism, well, that's another animal altogether. <laughs> and it's not, it's actually, particularly if you include in your rights, uh, economic and social rights, which incidentally the Quebec Charter does, um, then you cannot really uh, put this together with the kind of liberalism which has been defined by Reagan and Thatcher and which is generally speaking defended more recently by the Republicans in the United States. Yeah, yeah you know, I, it's it's an interesting thing. You, uh, you know, Chuck, I, I, I once remember uh, asking Ronnie Dworkin, uh, after he gave these due lectures at Columbia, about economic rights. And he actually said this, he said, you know, there can't be any economic rights to things like uh, work, you know, employment and so on. There, there just can't be any economic rights because liberalism um, doesn't consider anything to be rights unless it can guarantee, unless the state can guarantee its implementation. And, and you can't guarantee the implementation of employment. In fact, I suppose, it, since many people see capitalism as requiring a certain amount of unemployment, you can see why liberalism, if it's tied to, by and large, capitalist societies, uh, couldn't possibly, I mean, have it as a, if you define it the way Ronnie did, uh, you know, Dworkin did. And, and I've always found that, and so I think Dworkin's view was, you can use the word rights in this mobilizational way, you know, in this exhorting way, where we must have economic rights, but that's just a, a sort of mobilizational rhetorical thing. It's not the real thing in liberalism because, you know, you can't guarantee it. So, so the British state would spend millions of pounds guaranteeing Salman Rushdie's freedom of speech right. But it can't, it can't guarantee economic rights because, you know, it just can't. It's, it's a, it's a, um, it's a capitalist society. And, and that was Rani's uh, view. And India's never had that view. As you said, Montreal doesn't have it. And India's put in socioeconomic rights into the constitution. It's not implemented them, but it's a, it, it, has it, 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 it has it in the constitution. And, and, it's, and I'd be curious to know what, what you'd say about this, because, you know, right now, the rights which are in the constitution, such as freedom of speech in India, are absolutely not guaranteed. I mean, journalists are being assassinated, leave alone, you know, uh, and the government is winking at it. And it, it's just appalling. Uh, universities are, are, you know, being violently um, attacked uh, if they exercise their, their freedom of uh, speech and expression. So if you take Dworkin's view saying only things are rights um, which can be implemented, and then you have a right like freedom of speech, and it's manifestly not implemented, then you have to conclude not just that India has an impeccable constitution which is not being implemented, you have to say it's not a right, because if the right requires it to be implemented, you know, it's an illiberal state. It's not a liberal state which is not living up to its liberalism, it's an illiberal state. I mean, you can't have it both ways, right? You can't say you can't have economic rights and you must have liberal, you, and you, because you can't implement them. And you can only have rights that you can implement. And then you don't implement the rights that you can, that you're supposed to implement. You are right from the ground up, not a liberal state. I'm just following Dworkin's logic on this. I mean, it's true there's a difference in the kind of right because you can, this is a situation in which you can entirely guarantee that nobody will be, let's say, persecuted for their 
political views. I mean, you don't ever in really entirely guarantee, but literally they come down very hard if the, that is ever violated. Whereas the same can't be true for rights like everyone having a job, uh, you know, economic and social rights. But there's still a good reason to include this in the, in the category of rights. And this is the following reason. Any Bill of Rights has to be seen as a whole, and the different kinds of rights have to be balanced against each other. I mean, how much do you put into defending the, the liberty of each individual if you allow <clears throat> them to be um, attacked from another direction, you know, and so on? It's a, the Bill of Rights is always seen as a whole, and people interpret it in such a way that you have to always keep these aims in, in mind. So there's a big difference between bills of rights that don't include these economic and social rights and those which do. Namely, that there's a extra reason why you can interfere with the, if you like, freedom of action of various actors if a policy to maximize employment requires it, right? And that, again, I'm back to these two definitions of liberalism. On the Reagan-Thatcher one, that's absolutely out, right? Put it aside. On the larger conception of rights that I'm proposing here, that I'm defending here, it right. isn't. It's a perfectly legitimate point. So I think that uh, Ronnie was a little bit too, I mean, I think that a great deal of, American left liberal theory, uh, Rawls and Dworkin and so on, was perhaps not aware of, uh, although they were totally against the kind of policies <laughs> that Reagan and I, these individuals I knew, that you knew very well, and they were utterly opposed to the policies of Reagan and so on. Uh, nevertheless, I think their theoretical formulations left a little bit of, of let's say, uh, vulnerability on that score. Yeah. Sick. Well, so what it, what it seems is that we're both of you are are in broad agreement about defining secularism um, in, in this sort of role in liberal societies as something that emerges in the sort of interaction between the expression of religious freedom and the articulation of certain rights at the basis of society. And there's a spectrum in terms of how those rights might be articulated, and we could still plausibly speak of, of liberal societies. Um, now, I'd be particularly interested, Akil, how might this analysis um, be illumined by the example of India? I mean, obviously, India during the 20th century goes through several massive upheavals, upheavals of independence, of partition, of the rise of Hindu nationalism. And how might the kind of the evolution of these ideals of uh, sort of political secularism and liberalism, constitutionalism, how might they have evolved in unique ways, in a ways that illumine through contrast or similarity with the examples of, of various North Atlantic societies? Yeah. Um, you know, Ben, I think that, in fact, uh, uh, the Indian constitution pretty much adopted uh, this idea of a lexicographical ordering what I described as a lexicographical ordering, which um, conception of um, uh, secularism, though it made an exception on one or two things like Muslim personal laws, etc., uh, to uh, uh, to the Muslims uh, on grounds in a kind of affirmative action way. You know, the, <clears throat> the idea was. Uh, this community has suffered a lot of loss of numbers because uh, people migrated uh, to Pakistan. They lost the zamindari, which is their, their land to uh, in, the, in this partition. Uh, they lost their language, actually. You know, in a fit of nationalistic peak, Urdu was just given to, to Pakistan and was removed from, from the medium of instruction in crucial Urdu speaking areas like UP and Bihar and so on. So, so the idea was these people have uh, lost a lot. Uh, and so to take away the, the, their culture, which resides in the, in the way they organize their families and, and uh, personal lives uh, uh, by reforming their their personal and family laws, as the Hindu personal and family laws were were reformed, would be would be a bad thing. So there was a temporary uh, concession saying 
they should be allowed to retain unreformed Sharia laws uh, on personal and family matters until such time as they are confident. Uh, gain the, the community gains confidence to accept the state reform of, of uh, these laws on a par with uh, Hindu laws. So it was a kind of affirmative action move uh, to say, you know, until such time as the communities gets uh, strong, they will be allowed this concession. And that's just how affirmative action thinks of various forms of concessions to, to historically oppressed minorities. So, so uh, I think that's uh, how, that was the one modification, but otherwise it was the lexicographical ordering. Uh, one, the, the people who've been influenced by Charles in, in India and have worked with Charles are, on this have preferred his formulation of it in terms of neutrality rather than the lexicographical ordinary. But as we said earlier, uh, it, you know, those two lead to the same outcomes, even though they're formulated uh, differentially, yeah. Well, this, um, this question of how we, we define modern secularity um, is very often articulated in terms of narratives of history and an understanding of how we got to where we are in society and what kind of problems we face and how we might potentially resolve those problems. Um, so one of the assumptions that sort of the classical narratives of, of the emergence of modern secularism um, tend to support is this assumption that the only way out of modern secularity would be through the creation of a kind of oppressive theocratic state, the, you know, popularly described by Margaret Atwood and Handmaid's Tale. But from my own reading of your work, um, you don't necessarily seem to suggest that this would necessarily be the case. So Akhil, for example, you note sympathetically how Gandhi suggested that because early 20th century India didn't have the same kind of uh, religious sectarianism as the early modern Europe, modern India didn't necessarily need secular politics. Now you say that situation changed, therefore it does, but there at least was a possibility of, of something else. And Charles, your own analyses at times seem to imply that if med medieval Europeans had made different decisions, particularly theologically, we might now have something quite different than, you know, the imminent frame of, of modern secularism. So let's imagine hypothetically that at some point in the future, humanity has adopted a more mature relationship with the kind of transcendent ideals that motivate the great religions and philosophies of the world. Um, so in this scenario, there could be something like an overlapping consensus of higher goods that pervades our political culture, our public culture, one that allows for meaningful freedom, um, but also embeds certain religious or philosophical ideals in the main institutions of society. Um, you could even imagine hypothetically that through some kind of shift of public viewpoint, there's a pretty widespread consensus about the reality of transcendence. Um, in a way that it becomes uncontroversial in the sort of social imaginary of the day. So would such a society that was still morally admirable from a current liberal perspective, would it have moved beyond the framework of modern secularity? Why or why not? And if so, would you consider uh, it reasonable or even more importantly, uh, responsible for modern peoples to aspire to realize for lack of a better term, such a post-secular state of affairs? Um, so maybe, Akhil, we could begin with you. I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about this. Uh -huh. Well, you know, it's interesting about Gandhi. Uh, I think Gandhi's views here are really very deep. And, and I think they are, in one sense, which I'd like to, to get Charles's views on too, because I'm, I, I'm not going to find it easy to... to formulate this, partly because it's it's so deep. Um, you see, Gandhi was completely indifferent to, not just to, to secularism, because he thought, so, so his, idea, his, his idea on secularism was simply this. He said secularism was needed in the West, in, in Europe, because in Europe, um, uh, nation building exercises, uh, created the idea of a feeling for the nation uh, by finding an external enemy within, saying the nation is ours, not theirs. That was the strategy for constructing a nationalist ideal. 
uh, and uh, you know later on this came to be called majoritarianism, religious majoritarianism when you know when it was uh, Catholics in Protestant countries, vice versa, etc. I mean just Jews, Irish, you know you've got the standard uh, examples of the external enemy within. Now Gandhi said, we've never had this nation building. Uh, you know, so all the period that Gandhi was uh, struggling for Indian freedom, he said, India's never had this. So what is the secularism? It's supposed to correct a damage which we've never had. Uh, you know, so it's irrelevant. It would be slavish mimicry to adopt it. Well, that's one thing. <clears throat> but the, the deeper point, which I find very hard to formulate, uh, but I think really was moving him, is that he he really saw secularism as part of his general understanding of codes and constitutions and laws which, in which human beings get reduced to citizens. And he thought human beings just are not reducible in that way. Uh, and so his idea was that even if you had these constitutions and all, which all his colleagues really, you know, Nehru, Ambedkar and all were just full speed ahead on these, this way of thinking about governance. And, and Gandhi kept saying, even if you have them, they're a sort of foreground to correct various things, to correct bad behavior, right? That's the point of law. And, um, but it can't be the sum total of the point of law. Right, the the point of laws, etc., shouldn't just be corrective, you know, uh, uh, with sanctions, forcing people to do good when when they have a tendency to do bad, etc. That can't be the eventual goal. The eventual goal must be to restore us to the habits of democracy. Right? So it was very Burkean. So he kept talking about the customs and habits of democracy and saw law as having just a transitional importance, right? To really get you back to the unselfconscious pluralism and you know, relation, unalienated relations between people. And in a way, this is a little bit like, I mean, if you read The Birth of Tragedy, Nietzsche talks about, you know, the Apollonian or the representational, and then there's the Dionysian, which is the you know unselfconscious, the the the, the non-discursive, etc. It's a little bit like that. So the background is one of, you know, just just these unselfconscious relations between people, the habits and customs of what we would call democracy in the more formal, discursive, representational sense, right? And he said, if you don't keep the background in mind, the foreground is tyrannical. It's reductive. You know, and, and I think in a way he's deeper than Foucault because Foucault, what it, Foucault calls discipline, punish, etc., is all, is really the right way to express Foucault's anxiety is that you've made the foreground the whole ground uh, after the Enlightenment penality, right? And you really should see it as merely the foreground to a background of these unselfconscious relations. That's what Gandhi was saying. I think Gandhi expressed it better than Foucault because Foucault didn't put it quite this way. Anyway, that's a, a kind of Heideggerian reading of Gandhi, which uh, I'd be curious to, uh, to hear from Charles about. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, you know, I've learned a lot from you on this, and I think it's absolutely right. And it's what he... It's a piece with his whole conception of, uh, you know, of civilization and of, of the economy, where, where the spontaneous relations between people that are based on a very long-standing culture are really given their their, their space. But uh, I have to say that if we look into the future, <laughs> that the moment when we're going to be able to dispense with law as a check on various kinds of division and exploitation and denial of the rights of some in the name of others and so on. The day that we're going to be able to dispense with that is I'm looking as far ahead as I can. <laughs> I'm just not seeing it, not seeing it. Because, I mean, there's two two reasons for that, which get back to the original question that uh, Ben gave. One is that um, I see our culture 
as increasingly in producing new original positions, metaphysical, religious, non-religious, and so on. There's a great inventivity, I think, is just going on in, in our culture. I mean, it's not just the standard religions of the past of people who want to unite Christianity to Buddhism or even start on a new track and so on. So that we're we're dealing with, and this is something to do with the ethic of authenticity, I think we're dealing with a world, anyway, in the West, in which this kind of, uh, uh, if you like, differentiation and this kind of diversity is going to multiply. And secondly, there is, it seems to be a very difficult, irresistible temptation on the part of certain groups to draw lines. And we can see that in the present plight of so many of our democracies, which are plagued by demagogues, I would put it this way, who want to take a dividing line where there's been a certain resentment or fear of the other and make that their basis of mobilization. So you have two you know, obvious cases of this, but there are lots of others. You have Trump and you have Modi. It's no, no uh, surprise that they get on really wonderfully well when they get together, right? But you and the the deep sinking into the darkness of, of illiberalism and persecution and so on, which you see implicit in both their positions, is very very similar. And if only with just these two monsters, but you know, I I challenge to find a Western democracy in which there isn't uh, some kind of movement in this direction. You know, we, we have the Front National, the Rallyment National in France, and we have the, you know, the Gert Builders in the Netherlands, and we have Salvini, I could go on and on and on, <laughs> Kaczynski and Orban and so on. <clears throat> so we are plagued by this kind of discriminatory politics, which is very, very potentially, uh, you know, Pay, pay dirt is there for politicians who are absolutely without scruples about this. And I, so I don't see our arriving at this higher plane, either the one imagined by Gandhi or the one that Ben was describing earlier, if only <laughs> that, was, that was possible. But, but you know, it's interesting that, that there, there can be, in the interstices, moments where some of these possibilities are right. So if you look at at what Bishop Tutu and Mandela, mostly Tutu actually, tried to do in the in the transitional case in South Africa, in the truth and reconciliation stuff. It was so interesting that that what they what they were basically trying to say was that there's let's try another way of thinking about the law. Right? So it's it's not just it's not the standard criminal law where you know you have where you have the accused sitting silently in the dark and objective evidence is gathered to, you know, to so, so look, we've got to live with these people. They've oppressed us, you know, this apartheid was about the worst possible, horrible thing. But here we have a moment where, you know, it's the end of the regi apartheid regime. We have a moment to do the, you know, what Gandhi was saying, which is, look, let's just, let's just see it as, Give them a chance to talk. Give them full agency. Don't put them in the standard sense of, you know, there's the law. Here you are the accused. We're going to bring evidence in a detached, objective way. You speak up. You tell us about what you did and why you did it. You know, so the whole going back to the confessional thing, you know, which was an old regime. Uh, uh, in the old regime, France, confession was the highest form of evidence. Uh, if you remember, you know, it's only with the Enlightenment that that was that was changed. So, so the idea was, we need healing. We don't need incarceration. We don't, need, and we need uh, we need full agency between the accused, and you know, we want a complete dialogue and so on. So that was the kind of thing Gandhi was was talking about. You know, that that the unselfconscious relations, maybe one one day we will restore that. And uh, and and all I'm saying is that there was an interstitial moment in the Truth and Reconciliation, which was living up, trying to live up. I mean, I don't know if it was successful or not. I probably think it wasn't in the end. But but uh, I think there are inspirational moments where even in the public realm, this can happen, or at least attempt to happen. Uh, this can no, happen. I think that, no, I yeah. think that's absolutely true. I think there are the two kinds of movements going on. I stress the negative one, but there is a positive one. And I'm thinking of, 
you know, the, the murder of George Floyd, which is extraordinary in its consequences. Yeah. It not only activated on obviously Black Lives Matter, but the demonstrations for Black Lives Matter immediately spread to a lot of other kinds of discrimination. I mean, against all other kinds of discrimination. And they spread in the United States to other kinds, but they also spread across the world uh, to all kinds of, of, of discrimination. In other words, there was a real will. This is, this is the kind of Gandhian moment, if you like, or the moment outside the law where a desire to really be fellow citizens with, comrades with, uh, live with in a, in a kind of non-discriminatory way it bubbles up very powerfully. And I think it has something to do with the fact that COVID was at that point, you know, the weighing down on us. In other words, there was a danger weighing on everybody, regardless of their political view, regardless of their uh, particular sociological group and so on. So this sense of being in solidarity together with the terrible crime, and maybe the fact that everybody was at home watching television, you know, that that meant the murder of uh, George Floyd had this incredibly powerful yeah. consequence. Politically speaking, I mean, I'm all for taking these movements when they happen and trying to carry them forward as far as they can they can go. And I mean, this indeed, this is a, the heart of a good politics. So let's call that the Gandhian moment, right? A Gandhian moment. And uh, we must cherish those. We must never simply suppress them in the name of, of law. That's absolutely true. Well, I hesitate to interrupt such an interesting exchange, but I do it knowing that the next one will be just as interesting. So, uh, Akhil, I want to turn now more directly um, to your own chapter in Beyond the Secular West, which I find to be enormously rich and stimulating. In it, you echo Gandhi's critique of the conceptual transformations that underpin modern capitalist society. And, and you began to touch on these. The uh, for example, the modern transformation of the concept of nature into the concept of natural resources to be exploited, or the tra transformation of the concept of knowledge is to live by into expertise to rule by. You argue that while these conceptual transformations have shaped our dominant public and collective framework of thought, they're not necessarily echoed in the everyday local communal lives of ordinary people. In other words, there's an inconsistency between on the one hand, the ideas and ideologies that shape public policies and structures leading to all kinds of harms and curtailments of agency. And on the other hand, the care and concern that ordinary people show in their everyday local lives for one another or for their environment. And as you explained in the essay, um, this suggests that if we want to fundamentally transform the structures of capitalist modernity, we need to draw on the conceptual resources that are enshrined in local forms of um, solidarity and concern. And in particular, we need to draw on ideas and instincts that were shaped outside the hegemonic assumptions of secular Latin Christendom. We need to look, for example, to indigenous societies and their postures towards nature. So I'm wondering, first of all, could you elaborate this idea for us? And in particular, uh, what are its implications for a society that I agree with you is in need of another fundamental or radical transformation? Yeah, um, well, you know, what I was trying to say there was just really trying to spell out the relevance in for politics for what psychologists uh, following some uh, 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 distinctions in mathematical logic, what psychologists call the frame problem. Right? The, the idea of the frame problem is that that people don't realize they're being inconsistent because they are thinking in two different frames. Um, and so my, my idea was that we have a quotidian frame and we have a more public and collective frame and each individual is in both frames and, uh, and thinks very differently but doesn't know she or he is being inconsistent. Um, so, uh, I mean, let me give you an absolutely uh, 
uh, anecdotal and rudimentary example. You know, my mother-in-law was a Republican, a conservative Republican. And so one day I, I went to pick her up from the airport uh, to bring her home. And, you know, we live near Columbia, so we have to, to come through Harlem. And uh, uh, so we were driving past and she was really moved by, you know, the, the horrible conditions of Harlem, you know, people on uh, homeless and people on the street. And she says, something has to be done about this. This is terrible. I, I can't say, you know, we must, what, what can be done and so on? Just full of compassion. And then we come home and I fix her a drink and, and I say, that's wonderful, Dorothy. Uh, uh, so do you think there should be public expenditure on, on uh, you know, she says, absolutely not. Are you mad? <laughs> Uh, so, so, you know, here she, no doubt, she, now she was thinking in the more public frame, no doubt, uh, as a result of economics courses she took as a school kid or college kid. And, you know, so these are just two different frames that she was thinking in. She had no idea she was being inconsistent. She was, you know, she, um, or a, a complicated inconsistency there. And I think that's, that's generally true. Even this uh, buffer itself that, uh, 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 Ch Charles uh, talks of, I think, you know, I, I don't think if we are comprehensively buffered selves, we, we could even be agents in our everyday ordinary life. I think that we can only be capable of practical agency if we are responsive to to meanings and values in the world. Otherwise, we, we uh, I don't, I mean, I have an argument for this, but I won't try and spell it out here. So, So in that sense, I think, We've never been buffered selves in this quotidian sense. You know, we've always been responsive to meanings and so on. But in our collective public frame of thinking, we've completely ushered out, you know, the meaningfulness and the value ladenness of, of uh, the, the life around us. So, so Gandhi's view was, we've, politics, first of all, has to remove the boundaries between these two frames so that people realize they're inconsistent. And then it has to seek to scale up the influence of the, the kind of thinking that goes in the quotidian frame, find efforts to, to use it as a critical and conceptual resource against what uh, the thinking of the other public frame. And, you know, the person who's actually done this with real insight and, and institutional detail is Eleanor Ostrom. Mm. It's very well worth reading her stuff on the commons. It's remarkable stuff. You know, she's the Nobel economist. She's not an economist, but she won the prize for economics, one of the few occasions when that prize was given to a, a serious person, a person with views that aren't obviously false. Uh, and it, uh, uh, and it, it's it's a remarkable thing. And if, the book is very remarkable, governing the commons. But if you just read a Nobel Prize lecture, the, uh, she talks about how you can have a polycentric view, where you can look at the local and try and bring it to to influence on the on the center, and then then come back to 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 the local. Uh, uh, and so don't don't give up the idea of more centralized forms of governance, but see a mutual relation between them. A very fascinating essay, very well worth reading. Well, Charles, I, I definitely want to get your reaction to this, but if I could insert um, a related question before you respond. I'm wondering if these ideas have resonances with your recent book, uh, co-authored with Patricia Nance and Madeleine Taylor, on uh, reconstructing democracy from the ground up. Uh, the vision you lay out in the book, of course, focuses on the West and um, it's much more a project of reform and reconstruction than it is one of fundamental transformation. But still it's a vision that I think is premised on the recognition that instruments of modernity have engendered a crisis of meaningful agency and that the resolution of that crisis lies at least in part on knowledge and creativity generated and harnessed at the level of local community. So I, I would really enjoy also hearing some of your thoughts on that front in addition to responding to, to Akhil's comments. No, no. I think there's, there's a lot of a uh, lot of resonance. But I we started from another angle, which is what's wrong with our democracies. And, and one of the things that's terribly wrong with democracies is that lots and lots and lots of citizens 
don't have a sense that they have any levers to pull. I mean, they, they want they want something else different, but they don't know where to begin. They don't know how to mobilize for it. They, whereas there was a period when we had sort of uh, social democratic parties and conservative parties where you sort of have the idea if you want a bit more welfare, you vote labor, and if you, or, and if you want less, you vote uh, <coughs> the other side. So and it, it's this sense of citizen, I call it citizen inefficacy, the lack of citizen efficacy, which is behind, I think, the, this tremendous mobilization of false kinds of efficacy, like make America great again and so on. So part of our thinking was, how do we reestablish this connection? And very obviously, what's happened in certain areas, and we give examples in the book of this kind of thing happening, when you begin to get this kind of local organization, you get people together. First of all, they begin to realize that they're not necessarily total enemies if they're Democrats and Republicans, that they have certain interests and ambitions in common. Then they kind of work out what they would like to see happen. And you get a, a sense of efficacy growing and a sense of what they'd really like to bring about coming together. And that gives them something to mobilized for at the state level or the federal level and so on in the in broader politics. And what ends up happening is that these people get reconnected to the political system in a really authentic way. In other words, they're not voting for something which appeals to one side of them, but which in the case of Trump, for example, is going to totally betray the, their basic interests and <laughs> getting jobs and, and so on. They're voting for something that they really understand, and they have this sense of efficacy, sense that, that as citizens they can actually do something. So that's why the whole the title of the book is "Reconstructing Democracy," the, reconstructing the whole democratic society, but from the ground up, from the local up. And I think there's a lot of overlap between the the two frames that Nikki was talking about, and here the two frames, the the frame of the locality, which is not a frame anymore because people are don't know what their locality is concerned with anymore. They don't know what they share with their neighbors. They don't know, etc. But that frame kind of is falling apart. And the bigger frame up there, which they see as something totally alien, coming down on them, doing wreaking havoc in their lives and so on. And you get back the connection by recreating that local frame. This is a local frame on a slightly larger scale than Akil was talking about, but it's a very parallel kind of idea. Yes. So I agree with that. Yes. Yes, you know, I I, I really uh, not only completely agree with that, but I very much hope that something like that can be slowly constructed. Uh, you know, I actually feel very pessimistic, though. I mean, I, I just feel that Something has happened to the electoral politics of, of liberal democracies where um, we've even lost the, we've got no conceptual vocabulary even, leave alone policies, uh, to really understand what's going on. I mean, I, I don't mean a few professors, right, uh, who, who write books like that, but I mean, it's not part of the zeitgeist. It's just uh, where, where electoral politics is, is uh, uh, and and uh, you know if you look at the history of of capital uh, in the last fifty years, there was this sort of it now seems amazing period after the Second World War, when when there were serious constraints put on capital. I mean, mostly thanks to Keynes's uh, Keynesian constraints uh, that that were uh, put in the rise of social democracy, but. There was this, um, this astonishing move sometime in the late 70s whose effects were felt from the 80s onwards, whereby I think it was with the, with the remantling of the Bretton Woods institutions that you got a kind of finance capital, uh, you know, uh, dominating uh, uh, capital and it got globalized. And, and any time anybody tried to develop really social democratic constraints on capital, there was the anxiety of capital flight, right? I mean, capital flight just became exponentially increased after the Bretton Woods institutions got dismantled. Uh, and you got what we now call global finance capital. And 
And as a result, no local effort to implement social, real progressive social democratic things could last very long because of an anxiety of capital flight. Right? Uh, we'll go somewhere else if, if you're going to put constraints on us. Is, was a, and the idea that, the, so various movements like the movements which which uh, which got Lula elected, etc. You know, I mean, the things like that, or, or Morales elected in Latin America. Uh, the, those people came with very wonderful progressive platforms. They really couldn't implement very much because of this anxiety, and and so I feel very pessimistic because you know you had these movements which gave rise to to these real social democratic parties winning, and because of cap anxieties about capital flight, they couldn't implement their programs. And you'd have to have movements waiting at the places where the capital flies to. So you'd have to have tremendous international solidarities in order to, to get anywhere. But there's never been any international solidarities of that kind. I mean, Podemos didn't even support Syriza and Greece. You know, it, it, it's, it's just pie in the sky to think that we're going to have an international progressive movement. So, so I feel very pessimistic. And if Charles is right that it can only be done in this locally reconstructive way and then trying to, to scale up, I very much hope that that, that that can work. And it would be great to, to look at the details of how to make it work. But on the larger scale, I feel very pessimistic indeed. You know, uh, Frederick Jameson uh, said once, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I think, that, I think that, that that's what I mean. I mean, a lot of these populisms come because people have no idea, they have no con concepts even by which to understand and criticize this very bad aspect of capitalism that has emerged in the neoliberal period. And as a result, they go for all these crazy, uh, you know, right-wing fascist zeitgeist, because in their own zeitgeist, they have, they, have no, they have no means to understand what's going on, leave alone criticize it. Uh, Charles, I, I get the sense from your recent writing that you're perhaps more optimistic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can see, I, I, you know, the total control over this is uh, something that we can't get. But let's look at a certain very important aspect of capital flight, uh, if you like, uh, the, the movement of resources into tax havens, right, which makes it very difficult to raise tax levels on the, on the uh, corporations in your territory because it's going to go elsewhere. When I wouldn't require absolutely uh, universal solidarity of all peoples to put an end to this, what you need is an agreement among the big economies, the G20, that, uh, for instance, I mean, a very simple principle, you pay taxes on the money you earn in a given uh, jurisdiction, you pay taxes in that jurisdiction, right? Uh, you don't jigger the books of your international exchange that uh, you, you make an immense uh, profit in the Cayman Islands and you end up with almost nothing in the United States and the UK. This could be stopped. And this, this is something which is a huge obstacle to increasing the tax level, taxing the wealth of the, of the society, which we absolutely need to do, not only to rebalance the inequalities, but also to address global warming. So you can begin to make certain moves uh, on, me, on, on this level. I mean, the fact is that capitalism, in a certain sense, uh, we can't live without it, but we can't live easily with it because it tends to irresponsibility. And the bigger the scale in which it exists, the more irresponsible it is. If you get small businesses in a local community, you're not going to probably get cheated because, you know, you're going to be going to the same club with the person you're, <laughs> you're, you're cheating and, and you just can't live uh, with other people with, with that kind of relationship. But if you're dealing with international corporations, there's absolutely no restraint of that kind. So you get these utterly horrifying things like the oil industry systematically lying to the public over decades about the results of global warming in order to make sure that they aren't, that there isn't any move against them. I think it's possible to conceive of, particularly under the impress of global warming, it's possible to conceive of 
common action among the, anyway, big economies, big powerful economies. Uh, and we'll see. We'll see what, uh, you know, what the Biden presidency produces. And of course, it depends on who wins those those uh, seats in uh, <laughs> Senate seats in Georgia, but <clears throat> I, I, well, I, I have to say uh, I have to put a little sort of stop on this because my friends all say to me that I'm hopelessly optimistic, and perhaps that's true because I can't live any other way. But I still think I see certain paths that we can we can enter on, which would greatly improve the situation. Yeah. So, you know, one of the interesting things is um, on climate change, um, if you look at the indigenous groups, uh, such as particularly in Bolivia, one of the what, what made Bolivia so unique was it was an indigenous group which gained power. I, don't, I believe for the first time anywhere uh, in, in, in uh, recent history. Uh, <clears throat> And, you know, it, it was so interesting. So, so Morales uh, walked out of Copenhagen, you know, the Copenhagen climate meetings. And he said, listen, you guys haven't mentioned the basic root problems at all. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you've, you're tinkering. It's never going to get anywhere unless you really uh, change uh, thinking about this. He he walked out of the Copenhagen meeting, uh, took the whole Latin American group with him, uh, the, well, the progressive uh, Latin American countries, and he called a summit in Bolivia. And some, I, I can't remember, but I think 40,000 people came from all the indigenous communities in the world to the summit. And so, so that was a case where at least for a short while, I mean, you know, uh, Morales didn't last very long, where uh, indigenous outlook on on climate uh, and so on, uh, you know, talk of nature having rights and things like that, very much part of how Morales uh, was talking. Uh, there was a glimmer of it of, of hope there, and and uh, uh, and it didn't last. But I do think the indigenous outlooks are really very impressive on this. And uh, metropolitan outlooks could do a lot to learn from them. Um. Well, maybe I'll, I'll move us along just a little bit further. Our conversation, I think, so far has had a lot to do with questions of identity. And of course, um, you've both written extensively and influentially on the topic. And I really wish we had another 90 minutes just to talk about that alone. But since we don't, um, let me ask a broad question on the theme of collective identity and then allow you to take the conversation where you will. We find ourselves, it seems to me, in a society where a uh, profound sense of insecure belonging has led both to the hardening and to the proliferation of group identities. People are sharpening the boundaries that separate them from others. And yet at the same time, discontent with the way in which these labels define us um, has led to seemingly countless inventions and permutations of in-groups and out-groups. Some form of universalism, uh, it seems to me, is essential to restoring a deeply secure sense of belonging. But liberalism, or let's say the ostensibly universalist underpinnings of liberalism and liberal democracy, are struggling to do this. And in fact, the typical objections that are directed towards universalism in relation to identity, that it is homogenizing and ethnocentric and, and uh, elitist, these sorts of, of objections and critiques have only become more amplified in our public consciousness in the last few years. So having said all of that, I wanna ask you, what's your latest thinking on these basic questions? How should we be uh, thinking about navigating and ultimately resolving these conceptual and social tensions around social identity? Charles, perhaps we could uh, start with you. I think that one of the things that is most negative today is people mobilizing around an identity which they see as threatened. It's, it's really backward looking. It's the idea we had this and now it's being threatened by these other people. 
But there are also mobilizations which are forward-looking, which say, here we are, we're different people, but we have this very important common goal which we should get behind. So a good example of that, I go back to the George Floyd-inspired movement. There's people from very many different backgrounds who have a sense that there's something that they can do together. Right? And so it's really these mobilizations which are looking back and mobilizations looking forward. I think you had a very good example in 2008 in the United States because the Obama mobilization was one of the forward kind. How can we make a more perfect union? And the response to that was the Tea Party, <laughs> which has a kind of high point back in 1774, rather far in the past, which we're being threatened with losing, right? So you you can't beat something with nothing is the is the slogan here. You can't beat, you know, if you like, Trump style negotiation uh, mobilization. Make America Great Again, which is pointing backwards, right? You can't beat that without a mobilization which is looking forward. But there are great grounds for bringing people together and such mobilizations because there are great common needs that are huge in our society. And I think that there will always be collective identities. They will always be in some kind of tension with each other. The health of our society is going to depend on whether we have these forward-looking ones, which bring together very different people, or we're based on the past divisions and very afraid that our particular our particular group is going to be threatened by those outside them. And that's, of course, what's, you know, I got back to my life in Quebec. <laughs> the reason we're having fights about the issues of discrimination is that there are certain readings of the identity which feel threatened by the arrival of, of Muslims, let's say. And there's another vision of the Quebec identity, which is that of a vibrant French-speaking society, which is englobing more and more kinds of people and more and more kinds of capacities, and so on. And this fight is going on the whole time. You've got to, you've got to beat that negative stuff with a positive goal. You know, before before you jump in, one of the participants had sort of amplified this question in India and sort of noting how people are even going back to the Mughal period to sort of speak about when Indi Indian identity or Hindu identity was at its prime. So in responding to that, I wonder if you could also speak about the way in which this backwards forwards kind of narration is, is happening in India as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, um, it was, it's certainly true, this uh, forward, yeah, forward is the right word, but the way I would add to, to Charles's description is to say it's forward, but it is also group identity that manages not to be sectarian. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so if you take, for instance, something like Gandhi's Khilafat movement in the 1920s, what happened was that he appealed to this completely eccentric, obscure cause from the point of view of, of uh, native India, uh, which was the, the Khalifa in the, at the end of the Ottoman Empire. He says, here's a cause for us, for, for Muslims in India. Right? It was a total, it was just a stroke of genius. So he wanted to mobilize the Muslims against the British. Right? And he seized on this opportunity and drew millions of Muslims in a very progressive movement. In fact, the dynamic pro progressive ef effects on it in Bengal, Bihar, Assam, and all were tremendous. I mean, you know, Muslims signed up with the women's suffrage bill, which they had never done before as a result of the dynamism of this movement. And so it was, it was, it was mobilizing Muslims qua Muslims but in a totally non-sectarian, anti-colonial cause. And that's, I think, the idea of this forward movement. I mean, you, you take the a, a group uh, with its identity forward in a cause that transcends the sectarian demands of the group uh, against other sects or other groups. And, and I think that's, uh, that requires a, a very, very specific kind of, of mobilization and uh, 
and that's very well worth exploring. I think the George Floyd moment was very much such a moment. So was the the excitement around Obama's uh, election and so on. Uh, the other interesting thing, Ben, is that in India, this question of identity that you're raising and to which Charles is responding, you see, there's it, it's there's a Something happened after the Second World War all over as a result of things like the Beveridge Report and so on, where there was a culture of benefits that became uh, central to politics. And, and what happened was initially the benefits, as, as Beveridge understood them, had entirely to do with class, right? Working people uh, was... Uh, and, and then people began to say, well, but what about the special needs of, let's say, physically disabled people? Right? And so for them, a further different kind of, of uh, uh, set of benefits emerged and demands were made on their behalf. And to this was added, but what about people who are not just physically disabled, but socially disabled by historical oppression? Right? And so a new category of groups emerged for which benefits, a culture of benefits would then apply. And so, and, and that's what happened in India in the 80s with a, 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 a set of recommendations called the Mandal Commission Emerge for caste identity, for backward castes and so on. Now, what is fascinating is that this way of mobilizing groups and group identities with a view to gaining benefits for them is very much part of the post Second World War uh, ethos for, of politics, the benefits ethos of politics, where the democratization consists in the, the demos demanding uh, things from the state, benefits from the state. Now, it's had mixed results. Nobody can deny that it has been, uh, you know, democratized India. Castes who had nothing before, either in terms of privilege or power, got to have some privilege and power as a result of this identity politics in the electoral field and, uh, you know, the legislative and executive responses to it. But on the other hand, what it has also done is that it has made it impossible to transcend caste. You know, somebody like Ambedkar said, had two ideas. One is to empower castes, and the other is to annihilate caste, right? And what this has done is empowered castes, but it has maintained that in a stasis because people don't want to give up the benefits, right? So it has re-entrenched caste because you're, you know, now you have these caste panchayats would say, no, you can't, you can't do anything that goes against the, the caste boundaries. You know, it's endogamous. You, you must... You must stick with your caste. And so all sorts of oppressive features of risen, you know, no interdining, no intermarriage, and this is strictly ruled because you don't want to give up the benefits, right? So in a way, it, it's, it's lots of step forward, but lots of step back too. And the inhalation of caste has just become a, you know, a completely uh, way out in the horizon as a, as a goal. So, so these are very complicated things in India. It's not easy to, to say something simple about them. Well, we're, we're moving toward the end of our, our time together. So just as a very quick last question, I wonder if you could each take a moment to share with us where your intellectual attention is headed. What are some of the urgent and important questions on your intellectual horizon? Um, and which do you think you'll be grappling with in the coming months and years? Well, plainly for me, it's this issue of what to do about our democracies, because we uh, we continually think of ourselves, repeatedly think of ourselves as on an upward rise after 1945, after the after the collapse of the wall, and so on. And it, it looked that way because a lot of countries that hadn't been democratic became democratic, and so on. And then we find that that way forward is succeeded by a wave backward, and how to cope with this present way backward, which is really terrifyingly impressive and widespread if you look at all the places. And of course, there's no, it's not one size fits all. There are very, very particular features of any particular society. 
but I'm engaged with, with others and I attempt to understand this whole backward movement and how to reverse it again and in, in the different societies in which it's it's raging. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a big part of my agenda. And Akil? Well, uh, well I'm, I, I've, uh, Charles has been a very bad influence on me. I, I have a, a, a 1300 page manuscript on Gandhi, which I'm trying to cut. That's all I'm doing right now. I'm not thinking. And it's all, you know, there's this role model of a secular age, which is a, a really very bad example to set to, to people. Oh, you publish it all, that's what. <laughs> <laughs> this subsequent generation, this Wagnerian uh, intellectual uh, <laughs> efforts. Uh, so basically, I'm not thinking about anything else but, but cutting this manuscript right now. <laughs> but it has got to do with a lot of these issues that, uh, uh, that Charles is... Yeah. The world needs it. <laughs> <laughs> That's really exciting. Um, well... Thank you both very much for being with us today. I think, you know, I can speak for definitely Sharzad and I, and I'm sure also for our um, audience members. This was a very thrilling and stimulating conversation. So thank you both for, for joining us. Thank you. Yes, we enjoyed it very much. So I hope you all can join us for our next talk, which will be on January 22nd. And we will have Sela Ben Habib and Kwame Anthony Appiah, who will be discussing the future of cosmopolitanism, which is, we were touching on many of these themes already in our conversation today. And I think it's gonna be a terrific event. Um, so I just wanted to conclude thanking our co-sponsors uh, and organizers, the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University, the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University, and the Center on Modernity and Transition. Um, so Akil, Charles, Sharzad, thank you very much for, for the conversation today. Thank you, Charles and Akil. It was such a pleasure talking with you. Nice to meet you. Good to see you, Chuck. See you again. Yeah. <laughs> when we can travel again, we'll get together. We must do that. Bye-bye, Charles. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.